Okay, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, I'd like to bring Trevor Wilkins from Scale Health uh, into the center stage here, if you will, and bring uh, Paul Reiser from MedHealth onto the center to do a little brief uh, introduction. We're glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Stacy. Hello, my name is Trevor Wilkins and I lead growth at Scale Health. Thank you all so much for attending today. We're so excited to have you and really looking forward to tackling this uh, very important discussion today. Uh, for a little bit of insight, Scale Health, we are a healthcare innovation hub based here in Los Angeles, California, but we have a global reach. Uh, really, we were built with the idea that innovators in the healthcare space and stakeholders in the space continuously missed each other. Uh, we're fortunate to have some great founders, some great institutions, investors here in the great city of Los Angeles that just kept missing each other. Um, we built Scale Health about two years ago, started building it, and uh, from there, we're able to start making these connections. have had some great success, but I think one of the biggest successes that we've had is connecting with great, uh, great, great similar groups around the nation and around the world, like uh, Tech Town in Detroit. Uh, they've they are our first partner outside of Southern California. Uh, and when we started discussing burnout amongst physicians, this came around very quickly. Uh, and they've been amazing partners in this and outside of everything. And we're excited to have a great uh, turnout for you today. And with that, I'll pass it over to Paul. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, in addition to echoing Trevor's comments, uh, I really want to say that I understand and we understand it is by no means is it easy for anyone to be here today. It's uh, particularly in the days that are simply so tough for many of us to wrap our minds around, you know, what's going on, what's next, how will we make it through? So just know that we appreciate you guys just even taking out the time for being here. For those who I have not yet met, uh, my name is Paul Reiser. I'm the director of Detroit Urban Solutions at Tech Town Detroit and also co-founder um, of MedHealth and proud partner to many individuals and organizations here today on this call. So including the great partnership, as Trevor mentioned, with Scale Health. So just a little bit about MedHealth. Uh, MedHealth convenes innovators, providers, payers, funders, health systems, economic developers, and businesses, of course, to accelerate innovative solutions that improve the quality of care not just in Michigan, but also nationally and even internationally, which is in large part driven by a strong working relationship with partners in Ontario. So events like today are, are critically important to our mission of really can be best summarized as connecting, convening and educating. And that's across healthcare communities and ecosystems while really working hard to identify tools, solutions and opportunities that can help address some of the most pressing challenges in healthcare. And so that's that's really what MedHealth is all about. And so with that being said, I think it's, it's really also worth mentioning that we're really inspired, um, and Trevor touched on this a bit, to bring this event together today because of our work and support is close to healthcare systems, to organizations, innovators, um, and many others in the industry. It was our belief that while there's an immense amount of deserving attention that has been applied to many victims and distressed communities impacted by COVID, we also turned to ourselves and asked the question around, well, well who's taking care of who's taking care of us? Um, furthermore, how can we bring more attention to this topic? How can we share ideas on how to address um, this stress and this burnout that is being experienced by many healthcare and frontline workers. So how can we talk about the solutions that may work, but maybe even most importantly, how can we ensure that our healthcare heroes know that we truly appreciate them and care deeply about their well-being? So that's what we're really um, here for today. Uh, we have an amazing panel, and I absolutely encourage all of the guests to post questions in the chat engage in the Q&A that we're gonna have um, um, for the last 20 minutes or so of this afternoon's discussion or morning for some. Um, so let's get into it. We have, an, like I said, an awesome panel as well as an amazing keynote speaker today, Dr. Arash, um, who is going to kick us off. Dr. Arash um, leads the Wayne State University STAR Clinic. STAR is an acronym that stands for Stress, Trauma and Anxiety Research. And you can find Star in his in his lab, Dr. Arash's lab, at starclab.org. 
But just a little bit more about Dr. Arash, his clinical work is mainly focused on anxiety and trauma related disorders, PTSD in civilians, first responders, law enforcement, refugees, and victims of torture and human trafficking. His clinic utilizes pharmacotherapy, also known as medication, psychotherapy, exercise, and lifestyle modification to help patients achieve their full capacity for a fulfilling, rewarding life. His research is also focused on anxiety disorders and trauma. So several research studies at the STAR Clinic examine the impact of exposure to war trauma in adults and children, Syrian and Iraqi refugees in the US, and even biological and psychological factors of risk and resilience. Uh, the STAR Clinic also researches neurobiology and psychotherapy and the utilization of even AR or augmented reality and telemedicine technologies for providing in vitro treatment, in vivo, I'm sorry, not in vitro, in, in vivo treatment for anxiety disorders and PTSD. Dr. Arash has a special, uh, very special interest in the personal meaning of trauma, uh, or in other words, how does personal interpretation of a traumatic experience affect the way that an individual is affected by it. Dr. Arash's work has been fre frequently featured on CNN, NPR, Washington Post, PBS, um, American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry, and tens of other media outlets. We are very privileged to have Dr. Arash with us here today. Please everyone, welcome with finger snaps. Um, our keynote speaker today, our guest speaker, Dr. Arash. Dr. Arash. Thank you so much, Paul, for <clears throat> having me and for such a lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist and I'm specialized in anything anxiety and trauma related. I work with different sorts and groups of victims of trauma from victims of torture and human trafficking to first responders, cops and firefighters, civilians, and also we do the research that we are doing. Basically, the purpose of our lab has been to not be an ivory tower kind of research lab that is just like publishing papers, but rather be able to bring the insight from neuroscience world to a clinic and make the clinical work better and improve the clinical practices. And later I can a little bit more about for example of uh, like uh, our work in neuroscience and augmented reality and why that is <clears throat> uh, that is our knowledge from basic neuroscience is helping us in that field so we are talking about this pan and this pandemic which has been a uh, which has been a very unusual experience may I a lot of times I tell my patients that at some point like trying, trying to put it in perspective you may in future tell your grandchildren this was the worst experience of your life, the way that like other people talk about the time of war. So there are elements, there are several elements in trauma and stress which make it a lot more painful and a lot more traumatic <clears throat> for any experience. One is uncertainty, one is transition, and one is lack of control. Uncertainty, basically everything was uncertain when we started this process. In like in a matter of weeks, we are told that we are dealing with a disease that we don't know much about. We don't know much about how it even spreads and we don't know what's going to happen to our economy, to our life, to our work, to our personal life, to our <clears throat> uh, social life. And then very, very rapidly we transition just like for some of uh, for those who are an employee or an employer. Just imagine if you wanted to implement one change in your uh, business and you would say okay from like i don't know we are planning over the course of the next three months we are gradually transitioning from this let's say in our field from this electronic medical record system to the other one you know how much of a hassle it was now everything transitioned in a person's life from the way we work the way we eat the way we work out the way we socialize we used to spend majority of our time with our colleagues now we're spending uh, most of our time with our spouses and pets and uh, uh, kids. Uh, we, a lot of us are separated from our uh, social support networks. And then there is the issue of lack of control because all the control we had at some point was just sitting at home. 
And <clears throat> there is data coming from previous pandemics and this one that uh, societies get really stressed. Uh, rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, all those issues increase among populations. And as I go, I might just like, <clears throat> sorry, I apologize, share some links here, like uh, about the data that I'm talking about. So for example, here's a link from the CDC about rates of stress and mental health issues and symptoms among uh, general population. So now for a person, work, a person working on the front line, imagine all of these issues are in place, like <clears throat> from the, all those aspects that we talk, losing all those potential ways of, uh, of de-stressing yourself and so much stress added to what is happening in life. And top that with a very contentious, painful, stressful, terrifying political year that we went through. So it was like all the bad things that we could get, like we got them together, regardless of which party you belong to and which kind of thinking you were to, because either side was terrified that the other side is going to ruin the country. So now for a person who is involved on the front line with the uh, care of the patients, you have that plus all those aspects of stress in the workplace, meaning that I don't know much about how to treat this illness. There's an extremely high workload. We have transitioned to doing everything in a different way. Now we have to be covered, not me, because I'm a psychiatrist working, uh, doing telemedicine, <clears throat> but <clears throat> sorry, those who are in the ICU. All the body covered, new product protocols, new complicated protocols. You may be actually a psychiatrist who was dragged to the ER, to the uh, ICU because of shortage of staff that you have to now do all the things that you never knew how to do or you were not doing on a, a regular basis. And then the lack of control, meaning that as physicians, usually we have a, a something that protects us against trauma and helps us is a sense of control you know that, okay, these are the ways I can treat. When a patient with terrible PTSD comes to me, some, someone who has seen horrific uh, <clears throat> scenes, post-traumatic stress disorder basically is when you are exposed to something very, very horrible, like natural disasters, rape, assault, uh, shooting, terrible car accidents, uh, or torture. When they come to me and I'm showered with the memories of these traumas they have gone through one thing that helps me a lot with my mental health is knowing that i can help them and this person in a matter of uh, weeks and months can be feeling much better but that was absent for a long period of time during the COVID. <clears throat> i mean the, especially uh the first half of the year when treatments were not solid we didn't we were not sure about what would be the best treatment methods and what would be the best approaches <clears throat> and basically, a lot of her healthcare workers had to just watch people die on a very unseen scale. Like if you were working in the, in the ICU before, as anybody, and we, have, and we don't want to just focus on physicians and forget about other people who have been doing all the work, nurses, respiratory therapists, the janitors in the ER are exposed to all those sceneries, the people who move the bodies, the dead bodies are involved to all those scenes. And this is happened, let's say before this in the ICU, I don't know, every few shifts you would have, you, you could have one super old person dying, but now you are seeing multiple people on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> and this has been very traumatic uh, to people. Uh, and uh, there have been surveys coming out uh, showing a high level of uh, exposure, uh, the symptoms of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, among frontline workers. Uh, other groups who have been involved has been, have been the EMS personnel, EMT personnel who have been, uh, who have to go to people's houses and bring them uh, to the ER have been the, uh, fire department personnel and the police force, because those also were involved in all these aspects of COVID. And every time you're dealing with the COVID patient, as any of these people in these roles, there's also risk of you getting contaminated. And even if you don't care about yourself and you are the most selfless person in the world, you know, that next is your family is, is threatened. There were physicians who were living in the garage because of like because they didn't want to uh, risk their families with this. 
So it has been a, like a, all these aspects and cumulative trauma. And cumulative trauma is a very uh, important aspect of our research and like a, a very bad aspect of trauma. Because let's say I am assaulted in, and robbed in, on a street once, and after that, I get some care and support and then come back to my normal life. I may develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but 8% of the U.S. population do have, uh, at some point in their life, pass all the threshold criteria, meaning have all the symptoms of nightmares and flashbacks and avoidance and like feeling terrible mood. That is part of life. But then I go back to my normal life. But for a person like the, for these people, uh, it was and is a continuation of months and months of exposure to these horrible scenes. That's the same thing that we see with uh, first responders, with the fire and police personnel. Because I do also work with uh, uh, Detroit Police Department and, and, and fire departments. We see a lot of those uh, like on a day-to-day -day basis, every time you're called... Uh, to go on uh, like a, I don't know what they call them, on a trip on a, or a mission, you don't know what you are dealing with. You, a lot, a lot of times I was talking to one of the cops because of the technology we are working on developing now last week. And they uh, said like the, more, the worst thing for him is the scenes of someone dying and they have to resuscitate and the family is yelling and screaming in terror and they're trying to save that baby. And this happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so... In our department, what we have been, and the other thing is that the way, in, in general, the way that me, uh, medical care uh, is provided, it, this pandemic has also expedited a lot of changes which were already happening. Like in our department, we were already doing telemedicine. Half of my clinical time was remotely working with the Federal Qualified Health Center under, in underserved area of Detroit, treating patients via telemedicine. Now, everything has switched to telemedicine. The good thing is that the insurances were forced to cover telemedicine care. And that actually benefits uh, because there's a ton of research that shows telemedicine is equally effective to face to face. And satisfaction on, for the patient and the uh, provider are also equal. And then it helps us actually special populations with limited resources. Let's say those people, let's say mother of several kids, a single mother with several kids who doesn't have a car, who doesn't have to go to the clinic or in the winter uh, of Michigan or doesn't have access to childcare to leave the kids and go to the clinic for several hours or people who cannot leave their jobs. So this, there have been also positives coming out of this. Like I have uh, had much less rate of no-show in my patients because now everybody's a phone call or a video call away. And uh, like I have cops calling me from inside of the police car. I have moms calling me from like inside the bathroom. I don't know, people calling from the lunch, lunch break. So <clears throat> what we have done also has been developing this program called Frontline Strong in our department where we have been ser basically offering these services for to our healthcare workers. Basically anyone with uh, uh, issues of like uh, stress, depression, anxiety that has been evolving during this time. And in general, uh, healthcare workers are a higher, higher stress uh, population who call and like we would, a uh, social worker, a therapist will screen them. And if there's any help they can do, they will provide. And if there's a need to do it for uh, like a higher level psych psychiatric care, then they would be referred to us. We have also been working with the emergency department at Wayne State University, basically having kind of a group sessions, meeting, chit chat, therapies, and and you gotta remember that uh, there's a joke that physicians are the worst, the worst patients. Uh, so like convincing these tough men and women, same applies to the police and fire. It's just like no, because like the the, the stigma, because and the fact that they have to be in control and in charge, and it's hard for them to accept vulnerability. So we have had this, these discussions with the ED department on ways of developing resilience and on ways of coping with these kind of stresses. Uh, and now we are basically advancing uh, these uh, uh, kind of services to, we recently got a contract with the Michigan State to uh, provide these services. And we have been working to the uh, first responders, including fire and police department from education to uh, counseling, peer support, and treatment. And a lot of these happen via telemedicine. I'm gonna uh, 
The other thing we did during this time was like, so as was mentioned earlier, our lab has been working on the augmented reality technology. And basically the idea is that, so if you're afraid of something, whether it's a fear of spiders or because you were traumatized and like, a, I don't know, you have been in a shootout and now any loud noise or any crowded place creates a fear uh, uh, because of PTSD or combat veteran like sees a roadkill and that reminds them of an IED. So exposure therapy is a very good treatment. We basically gradually expose the person to what they're afraid of. And that fear goes away. It's one of our most effective treatments. The problem is that majority of people expert in this field are in areas acad around academic environments away from other people, uh, from like uh, not uh, with the lack of access in remote areas. Uh, which can be addressed by telepsychiatry. But then the next problem is that if you came to my office and said, I'm afraid of spiders, I'm afraid of snakes, I'm afraid of dogs, I don't have spiders or dogs in my clinic. Even if I brought my dog to the clinic, that dog wouldn't listen to me and that would be just one dog. And then <clears throat> we cannot basically generalize this to all these different kinds of breeds of dogs that you may be afraid of. And then that happens in my office context and then you go home because we have not contextualized it to real life, then the fear may come back. We have been, for all these reasons, we have been using an augmented reality uh, 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 technology in our work. With, uh, I have to uh, uh, do the uh, disclaimer that this is a, uh, this is a project uh, patent, uh, idea patented by Wayne State University. So there's a conf potential conflict of interest here. Wayne State Tech Transfer Office is involved. I'm gonna show you, uh, and I know I have five minutes. I'm gonna show you uh, some video of a uh, very quick video of this technology uh, as where it is now uh, and the, its implication for the populations we are talking about. So basically, this is a technology we initially uh, started the proof of concept for fear of spiders, which is a very common fear. And these are real patients. So they wear the AR goggles, and this is what they see in the real environment. The cool thing is that they will be interacting people with the real life environment. It's not as if you're wearing, uh, wearing a, a AR headset and you're in a different world and you cannot even walk around because you will trip on, your, because, uh, on the coffee table. So I can place it. So as a provider, I see a 3D mapping of the patient's environment. I can, from a drop-down menu, choose the object of fear. I, I can place it in the environment wherever I need to. And then uh, I can see the black ring is where the patient's head is. The yellow light is where the patient is looking at. And all those arrows are the spiders I've placed in the environment. So I've I basically, I've become a movie director who directs the show and basically run the exposure. And this is the patient view patient. So these are basically the cool thing is that these are very accurately placed on the patient's environment. So it's interactive patient. I asked the patient to go close to them, try to like touch them, try to like, uh, I don't know, the spider will crawl from the table to the ceiling it can and we have different kinds and types and this is how we tested the effect of the treatment because at the end of the day we don't want people to feel comfortable with virtual spiders we want them to be uh, comfortable with real this this is a real patient and all of uh, that guy that little uh, animal is tony stark it's a tarantula and um, everybody uh, like all of the people we treated in a clinical trial in less than one hour touched the tarantula or the tank containing it and that was the only one session of treatment we did so we have been advancing this to uh fears of dogs is gradually making our objects more complicated and then fear of snakes and basically the idea is to create a library of all the feared objects that people, that a therapist can use for uh, exposure. So now when it comes to the situations that uh, let's say a police officer or a, a, a healthcare worker has to deal with and do we need exposure is like, as I mentioned, scenes of dead people or people doing CPR on a person who's there. So now we need more complicated human avatars that we have started working on uh, these are very, very, very primitive primary like efforts that we have put in Nexus to use basically actors to act and then we will create their avatars. And 
working on automation of these technologies so that the exposure can basically automatically happen on a patient's phone. And for that reason, we have been working on face mapping. During the pandemic, actually, we were we said, hey, well, because I also work a lot with the media, as Paul said earlier, I've been like talking to the media about how to deal with the stress of pandemic. We said, let's create an AR app for people's phones that they can use for free and they, we can uh, basically give them some tips about how to deal with the pandemic. And we worked on my face because we were, the idea was in future, we are hoping to basically create, if I have a therapist, we would create a 3D avatar of my therapist and in between sessions, I would do home practices on my phone with the face of that a avatar. Quick, uh, practical and this is an example of the app that we had created. Basically, you can bring a 3D time. version of me and a dog Number in your one, living room and then listen to... Uh, and we basically developed this app in a couple of months. The idea was that we wanted to uh, basically quickly uh, like send it out. So the quality may not be very uh, excellent, but that's the way we are going. And uh, I'm just going to share uh, the link to that app and a few, a couple of other like uh, the writings that I had about dealing with stress of the pandemic. And uh, I'll be more than happy to talk more later. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the last word is a pandemic. It might have caused transitions, but it might have also expedited the things which were already coming. One of them is telemedicine. Thank you, Dr. Arash. Really useful information. And if we weren't afraid of spiders, we might all be now. <laughs> um, I do just want to make sure that the links that you just dropped in, I think they just went to just us, the panelists. So I want to make sure that we can get that into the that link in for the attendees as well. Um, if one of our other um, administrators can copy that link and drop it in under um, panelists and attendees, that would be really helpful. So again, thank you. Um, we're so we're so grateful to have you here today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Stacy Frankovich. I am the program manager for Med Health um, here at Tech Town in Detroit. And um, it's been a pleasure working with Scale Health to put this event together. So we're gonna jump into our panel discussion. Um, I'm gonna bring Lisa McLaughlin, John Henderson, and Jeremy Fishbach on, um, on stage, if you will. And we'll get a little bit of a Brady Bunch thing going here um, soon, there we go. So what I'd really like to do is um, introduce each of you individually and give you a few minutes to talk about who you are and um, your technology or your role. And then we'll jump into some, some questions for everybody. So Lisa, why don't we start with you? Lisa McLaughlin is the co-founder and CEO of Work at Health. Um, Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and about Work at Health? Sure. Uh, thanks, TC, and thanks, Paul, for having us. It's always a pleasure to partner with this group. Um, so work it is, my background is that I had a, I was a social worker who got a little burnt out and studied information science and started developing systems um, and then have found myself building this company that's at the intersection of both. So work at health is a digital telemedicine platform that I co-founded um, with a friend in the Bay Area. Um, we started the company because we were both people in long-term recovery ourselves and had seen a lot of people that we knew uh, pass away since the time that we got sober at the end of the 90s. And um, most of that was due to um, having mismatch of care settings with people's lives and have rehab being very poorly designed. So today WorkIt is um, a rather large and growing telemedicine platform. We have over 10,000 patients and work with um, healthcare plans across the country, predominantly um, in the Medicaid space, but really across all different lines of business to deliver um, confidential rehab to, to people's phones. Um, and it's very exciting to, to share with this group and, and to share best practices. Thank you, Lisa. We're really glad to have you here today. Um, and I'm just going to go by what's on order of my screen. So John Henderson, you are the Vice President and Chief Information Officer um, out in California at Children's Hospital of Orange County. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your role and um, a little bit about your background? Sure. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm John Henderson, CIO for Children's Health Orange County. We are a pediatric uh, health system with uh, 
two inpatient facilities in uh, Orange County, uh, as well as uh, 25 plus primary cares and another 30 plus uh, specialty clinics. Um, you know, my role here is really all things technology, um, but it's also uh, trying to bridge the gap between uh, the technology that is beneficial uh, and trying to make sure that we aren't introducing technologies that take away from the experience, not only with our providers, but also patients, et cetera. Uh, you know, I've been in pediatric health IT the majority of my career. So I guess you could say uh, I have a passion for the, the pediatric healthcare side uh, and trying to intersect the uh, impact that uh, through technology. Oh, thank you so much. We're so glad to have you here. And um, a conversation for another day is probably how COVID is impacting our, our pediatric and our children's population. But um, thank you for being here today. And let's jump over to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy Fishbach is the vice president, oh, I'm sorry, the founder and CEO of Happy App. So Jeremy, how about you share a little bit about you and about Happy App? Yeah, honored to be here. Thank you, Stacey. Um, yeah, Happy is um, an innovative um, peer-based mental health platform. We have developed what we call a universal peer support model. So it's not focused on alcoholism or substance abuse or eating disorders, but really a very broad range of primary mental health issues, social isolation, loneliness, anxiety, situational depression. Uh, we have a national network of uh, highly qualified peers. It's a very different model. Our peers have backgrounds in healthcare and are uh, uh, chosen for their ability to provide what we see as the essential ingredient of mental health, emotional support um, exceptionally. And we have a lot of technology, mobile app, toll-free, inbound, outbound, all the purpose of which is to just enable people to connect and reconnect and build ongoing supportive relationships with our, our peers. And, and the ultimate goal is to have them build a new primary support system, a new primary mental health support system. Um, as almost everyone knows, um, the reason we have, one of the main reasons we have so many mental health epidemics, isolation, anxiety, depression, is that um, we have an epidemic deterioration of people's primary mental health support systems. And so we're trying to address that epidemic at the roots. We're partnered with um, the largest Medicaid plan in the country now, Centene Wellcare. We're going to be rolling out with um, a few other major payers in the next few months. And, and we're partnered with some large hospital systems. The American Nurses Association is their official peer support partner. And so, um, yeah, we, we see happy and services like this as a resource um, for vulnerable populations and for frontline workers um, and really everyone in between. And uh, honored to be here with, with all these um, distinguished panelists. So thank you. Well, we're very grateful to have all of you. And um, why don't we just, you know, with that, you all have such um, a, a different area of expertise that you bring to the table. So we're going to jump in. Some questions might be more um, designed for one of you or another. I know it's hard when you're in Zoom to talk over each other. So we'll just, we'll kind of figure it out. But um, the questions that we designed today were, were primarily for your discussion. I, I, I would like to fall into the background here and not have uh, be too much a part of the discussion, but let you all discuss. So for our first question really designed for all of you is really what is the impact of this COVID trauma that you have seen specifically in your areas or through your technologies? And, um, and if you have some specific examples of anyone in the frontline worker space that you can um, reflect upon. That would be great if, if that dialogue could take place. So whoever wants to start, <laughs> I'll leave it there. I'll just say um, to, to, to uh, relieve everyone else's anxiety about um, going first that, you know, ob uh, um, a couple points. I mean, one, social isolation, loneliness, um, mental health issues, as everyone knows, long preceded COVID and may have been exacerbated by COVID, but um, we're, we're here long before this. And so I, I don't want to, uh, I think we need to give COVID its, um, its credit um, in, in really making life worse for a lot of people. Of course, it, it brought a lot of people back into their homes where they could actually connect with family members more as well. 
Um, but it has certainly made things worse. Um, our partnerships, I'm sure everyone else has examples with, with for example, American Nurses Association, Ochsner Health System in Louisiana were specifically catalyzed by, by COVID. And as Dr. Arash was saying, just um, the, the, the increased burden um, uh, on frontline workers. Um, my fiance is an EMT. And I just started noticing that um, every day she came back from work, she was talking about seeing people dying and, and also just those people dying alone. Um, so in addition to just the trauma for frontline workers, I mean, just the trauma on their families um, from not just experiencing death, but experiencing it uh, alone themselves. I mean, uh, just horrifying. So I, I would certainly say, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to see this pandemic you know, hopefully in our rear view mirror soon. Yeah, I'm happy to go. So I echo a lot of those same reflections on seeing actual nurse practitioners that are on our staff and but, um, PAs, MDs that work um, moonlight with work it, but also work in emergency departments. Just seeing an enormous strain on those individuals um, in their sensitivity during their time with us after having been through these traumatic experiences on the weekends working in these shifts has been really alarming. Uh, but for, for our case, it's quite unusual because we were already dealing with an epidemic. So work it focuses largely on the opioid crisis and um, doing more intensive care for individuals with opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. Um, and we had started to see some gains before COVID in that in that crisis and so seeing numbers starting to go down, a lot of coordinated efforts across government health systems. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, there's just this huge influx of, and they now we're in a twin pandemic, right? So numbers went up again last year um, to 86,000. Um, we thought it was a huge crisis when it was 70,000, which is more people than died in the Vietnam war. Um, so it's just gotten to be of epic proportions, but like on a more like silver lining side of things, which I hate to, you know, talk, it's hard to talk about the silver linings, but I think, um, to Dr. Arash's point, um, the gains that we have seen in comfort with unique models and telemedicine, um, have been catalyzed by being in this crisis situation. And so, whereas like two years ago today, we would have been like, fighting hard for like very simple things in addiction care, like um, people being able to have um, access to care from the home if they couldn't go out or if they had a DUI and couldn't drive. Um, today, those things are all possible because of a lot of the regulatory changes that happened. Um, and what, that's actually been a miraculous thing for the space. Like we've seen um, telemedicine for addiction care become like a real standout case. Like stroke, you know, there are certain cases where we know now that telemedicine actually works 30% better than brick and mortar care because of a certain kind of situation. Someone has a stroke, they're at home, they need to be monitored. Um, we've been able to identify certain forms of addiction care that fit that. And we probably never would have known that had it not been for being like propelled into a situation where everyone just decided to suddenly permit telemedicine and not think that telemedicine groups were um, lower quality or meant that you were sending your patients to kind of a suboptimal middle of the road solution, but that they could actually excel and exceed expectations. So that on our side has led to our group quadrupling in, in growth in a year, um, which is, I think, been really exciting in a lot of ways as well. So Lisa, you're totally jumping, jumping into some of the questions we had, you know, a little further down the line, which is great. So if you don't mind, let's kind of just stick with, with that whole topic of telemedicine actually working because Dr. Arash, you and I spoke recently and you were talking about some, some data that was coming out of telemedicine as well and that you're finding that um, uh, you know the telemedicine options for psychiatry are working just as well. And I also wanna bring um, John into the conversation and, and ask what he's seeing from a telemedicine perspective um, from Children's Hospital in Orange County um, and kind of some of the data and the results that you're seeing. And then I'm gonna throw just another question into that long extended question. Um, Lisa, you made reference to some of the policy changes that have allowed for this telemedicine. Do we think that's permanent? Do, are these permanent changes or do we see um, them just being implemented as a, as a response to COVID? 
So there's a whole lot there that I just asked. So anybody jump in and, and let's let's keep going down this path. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in and just talk a bit about the telemedicine aspect on the pediatric side. Um, I think Dr. Ross mentioned this earlier, it really was a catalyst for us. We were probably doing maybe 200 telemedicine visits a year. Uh, we quickly transitioned within a couple of weeks of uh, kind of the shutdown and uh, stood up a program and we're seeing 600 patients a day from a telemedicine telehealth perspective. Uh, we've kind of leveled out a bit. Um, we're around 360 per day now, but that 600 per day lasted for a good four or five months before things started to normalize a bit. Um, it's been tremendous. Um, I, you know, we've seen some of the things that, I mean, Dr. Rush may speak to particular psychology clinics where uh, they have seen a tremendous amount of benefit um, being able to see kind of the social kind of what what, the, what does the home look like uh, with some of those visits gives them different insight than what they may normally get in the clinic uh, when you ask those similar types of questions. Uh, same thing from our primary care providers who are doing those visits. It really gives them a completely different uh, level of insight to, with the care that they're trying to provide. So uh, it's been tremendous for us. Um, we think it's, you know, for us, uh, you know, we hope it's not just a reaction, um, and we see this as a continuing business model uh, for us. Uh, it's something we wanted to be able to provide to give us more access and provide more access um, to uh, to the pediatric population, and, and we see that as uh, one of the, the big benefits for us. So I will, I'm going to try to just like combine an answer for the both of the questions you had. So the, the last year I, with a colleague, we wrote a piece about like how the humans is, as advanced as we are, we seem to be having difficulty understanding abstract concepts. Like when the COVID was uh, like uh, evolving in China to us it was just a story. When it hit Europe, it became like a movie pandemic to us. We still weren't like <clears throat> much amazed by it and then when it came here, we had to, as the most advanced medical system in the world, we had to see it right here, like setting everything on fire for us to understand. It seems like abstract concepts are very hard for us to understand. And uh, like, I never forget this example, like it, with the former president, it was like, just like downplaying, downplaying until one of his close friends died. And it was like, oh, this is crazy thing. So we need to feel it here before like, and, and, and I bring this example because for us to be able to understand what happens to those frontline workers, like we are just talking, when we are talking stats and numbers, and okay, 10 to 20% PTSD, these are just number. The reality is that I, if anyone is interested, just look up my last name and aching blue. I wrote this piece about uh, the police trauma applies to all of them. Imagine uh, they bring a, like a person, a young adult healthy to you and they are suffocating in front of you and they're dying and you cannot do anything about them while you're terrified. You may get the disease and take it to your like 80 year old mother. And this happens on a day-to-day -day basis every day, 10 hours, 12 hours, and your boss is also yelling at you and you're short-staffed because a few of your colleagues got the COVID. <clears throat> and there was a lot of demoralization in these groups and if our healthcare workers not also feeling appreciated. I like, um, because I'm in the physician's community, so people were feeling terrible that they are just putting their life on the line. And there were others who was, I don't know, the, pictures of people partying on the beach were coming out. Uh, <clears throat> so this is one aspect, but when it comes to telepsychiatry, uh, when I, uh, uh, when I uh, came out of my training and I came to my new job uh, about six years ago, when I was, uh, Wayne State Psychiatry already was doing telemedicine. And we had a tel telemedicine operation working with the clinics, with the ER, with uh, even like uh, substance use rehabs. And my initial knee-jerk reaction was that, no, it shouldn't feel as real as in person face to face. And then they presented me with data that, <coughs> sorry, showed telemedicine and face to face in terms of efficacy, satisfaction of the provider, satisfaction of the pain, their neck and neck, and it's equally effective. And then looking at especially when special with special populations and less privileged people who have difficulty with access, 
I had at that time patients who were driving four hours to come from a remote area in Michigan to see us in the clinic. So now that is all kind of gone. And uh, it has been as effective as we all mentioned, we have had a higher number of visits and lower number of no-shows like before this, and especially the uh, low socioeconomic clinic that we, uh, we were working uh, with because of all those uh, difficulties of access that I mentioned, we had about 40, 50 thousand percent uh, uh, no-show. Now it's like much lower than that. And I brought the idea of us being like a, like a difficult species in dealing with realities and change. I brought that because like before this, a big chunk of disagreement with telemedicine was the inertia we have anytime something new is introduced to us. We don't want the new things. We want things, uh, we, we have an inertia as a, as a group of uh, like as, as humans. We need another bigger fear, like, like a lazy person sitting on the couch <laughs> would leave the couch when there's a dog attacking them. We need that this COVID to expedite and, uh, this process. It makes sense. I, I don't see a way this going back. All I see, I mean, there, there probably will be people who prefer in-person and there will be in-person uh, treatment will be available, but this is going to be the future. And with other technologies, I don't know, with the technologies my lab is uh, trying to throw in mixed realities <clears throat> and VR, things maybe look very different uh, soon. Uh, and one of the complexities will be like, is this going to turn into like, uh, uh, like the way like the big ch corporation chains of grocery stores are eating like the mom and pop shops? Was, is that something that's going to happen to like a medical practice? Oh no, these are like all these challenging questions that will come up. Well, that's, yeah, the future, the future of healthcare is obviously um, changing right before our very eyes. Let's, I'm going to drill us back in a little bit, though, to those frontline workers um, that are, that as you mentioned, Dr. Arash, too, some of them have had to go home after a difficult night and deal with friends or family members that think COVID's a hoax, or um, actually having uh, um, patients' families yell at them or say things to them because a family member is is losing the battle and they don't believe it's COVID. So we, you know, so we do, not only are they, are they overworked and they're fighting this battle, but when they leave at the end of the day, they're almost fighting a different battle with those that are struggling with their belief on what this is and, and seeing the images of people partying on the beach and all that. So let's go back to those frontline workers. And, and John, maybe you're, you're in a good position to answer this because I'm sure at, at the leadership level of the hospital, you're having conversations about how do you address this within your, you know, em employee base? How do you, you know, we had high instances of physician suicide, physician um, drug and alcohol abuse before COVID. We, we had high instances in the nursing community. Um, we were dealing with a nursing shortage prior to COVID. So, you know, how, from a leadership perspective, is Children's Hospital of Orange County looking to address their employees' needs? All right, thanks, Stacey. It, you know, in a variety of ways, you know, I think a lot of times because the pediatric population hasn't been as impacted as the adult, um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to, to think that, well, maybe it's not really happening in those, in those uh, settings, but it, it is just at a, maybe a smaller scale. You know, I think some of the things that, uh, you know, we've seen lower inpatient volumes because of the pandemic. And so, you know, while, you know, obviously that's not what we um, had projected, but it also has helped in a sense from a staffing perspective in kind of that round the clock uh, component. We've had to deal with uh, uh, caregivers uh, getting COVID and short staff and those sorts of things. So some of the things we've tried to do um, uh, we've done a we've done do a tremendous amount of town halls with our, our chaplain service, uh, with our providers, our, our clinicians. We do a lot of town halls with the leadership team, with the whole organization, really just to educate and say, here's what we're doing. Uh, one of one of the things that we've been really mindful of is trying to make sure that we educate the community about how safe our hospital is and the protocols we have in place. Um, and so, you know, that's one element, but really the outreach with our providers and, and, and nurses and clinicians and just trying to keep them informed and really giving them a space to share their concerns uh, and be able to be in a position to 
uh, say, well, here's what we can do to solve uh, or work on this particular area where you have a concern, whether it's uh, the equipment, whether it's uh, our screening protocols or what, whatever the case may be, giving them space to, to voice their concern. That's been really important and we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think one of the other things, some of the other things uh, is really just continued education. You mentioned the, the dynamic of having to leave uh, after providing care and uh, interact with the rest of society who may not share the same belief about what COVID really is or isn't. Um, we've just tried to do a tremendous amount of education. Uh, our infectious disease uh, chief and, and, and providers, they've been doing a tremendous amount of education and just providing us with all, all of that information to help, uh, to help with that. Um, I think one of the things that I mentioned earlier with our chaplain services uh, and some of our, our mental health professionals, just making those things available has been really important uh, for us uh, as an organization to make sure people have those resources um, to, uh, to access, uh, even uh, to kind of just help them uh, work through some of the challenges that they're facing. Fantastic, fantastic. And then to you and uh, to Lisa and Jeremy also, so, you know, as, as innovators from the outside in looking at the, um, the health, you know, the frontline worker, the health community, um, have you seen changes in the way that your technology is being used for that population? Are, is it something you're even tracking? I, I mean, I don't know for sure if that's something you're even tracking, but has the frontline healthcare worker or even, and I say frontline healthcare worker, but we're also talking about police and fire and, you know, just those first responders that are coming into the apartments and are terrified to to try to transport somebody who, who is contagious and, and they're fearful. So are you seeing any type of um, increase in usage of your, your platforms from the front, front line perspective? We definitely are. So I, I work at, we have partnerships in New Jersey with the New Jersey Police Force so, and Cops, as well as first responders groups. And there, I think it's been, um, really wonderful to have confidential discreet care available to those members, especially because at such a controversial time in policing, like really um, many different types of responders are under a really high, high level of trauma right now. And we've seen a lot of gateways to even harm reduction approaches in substance abuse for clinicians, which never would have been there in the past. In the past, it would have been very punitive. You would have gone directly into a compliance program um, and been kind of at risk of losing your medical license. So that's been good to see companies get really modern about how they think about um, their workforce in these first responder groups as inevitably undergoing trauma and as such needing care, oftentimes care that could be stigmatized um, mm -hmm. in the professional side and changing their perspective on that has been super powerful. Thank you. How about Jeremy? How about you? Yeah, I mean, um... I think we've seen really two things. One is just um, heightened awareness that um, frontline workers need more support. And in a lot of our conversations, um, whether it's with large membership organizations, American nurses, mm -hmm. um, or large health systems, you know, they know that 30 or 40 percent of their workforce needs support. And that with existing EAPs, they have one or two percent utilization rate. So mm -hmm. I would say that the main thing um, we've really seen is a shift um, and at least our conversations from a focus on, uh, on the accessibility of resources versus adoption. Right now, there's actually a lot of resources that are available to people if they want to avail themselves of them and, and they're not. And we hear from all the organizations we talk to that there's a, a, a huge discrepancy between the you know the need um, and just and just actual utilization numbers. We we've innovated a lot in in, in um, doing much more uh, proactive, a, a much more proactive approach, and we've seen our 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 own um, engagement rates go from one two percent to almost thirty five percent in populations um, as large as um, tens of thousands of people, or in the case of a health plan. A couple million people, and so a lot of it's just been um, innovation that that we've had to push to to to, to really focus less on uh, what we think is just a much lower barrier to just have have resources available 
if they're not being used, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Have you, both you and Lisa, have you both, um, have you struggled at all with scaling to meet the need? We've invested, I think this is where our technology background has been extremely helpful. Like a lot of our investments to meet the scale experience that we're undergoing have been in optimization of provider workflows. So really investing in note-taking within the EHR and automation of assessments, um, things that will help our clinicians spend more time in care and less time in the burnout of assessment after assessment after, you know, we're all on these on-demand calls all day, like we are here. Um, if you're experiencing that as a clinician um, and then at night going home and filling out 30 assessments, whatever it is, like that's an added burden. That's not really about the patient clinician relationship. Um, and so that's where we've invested in scaling and has enabled us to have like uh, higher ratios of care um, enabled the system itself to do some of the lift and the compassion fatigue and like automating referrals, automating different things that would normally be an additional step for an already burdened provider that really just wants to focus on um, their real analysis of what's going on with patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeremy, any issues? No, we, we haven't. I mean, you know, our, our, our technology is very scalable and um, we have tens of thousands of people who are, are in queue, queue to be one of Happy's support givers. And we have a very streamlined um, vetting process that takes about a hundredth of the time for, uh, that it takes for a traditional peer program. So we haven't had, we haven't had issues. That's great. That's great. So as much as, I, I mean, I could have this conversation with you all day, but I do know we have a few questions coming into the Q and A. So I'm going to ask kind of this last question before we jump over to Robert and have him uh, moderate some, some questions from our audience. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of a two-parter. So, um, what do you see, and maybe this is for Dr. Arash and Dr. Henderson, as far as what do you see as far as any policy changes coming or any gap areas that are coming down the pike that might, that might need solutions? And then um, kind of for, for all of you, um, some final thoughts on where people can get help, how people can get help, or how, um, how technology is really being positioned to help. Um, so it's kind of this big, big, bold last question, but it's kind of these last thoughts about um, where you where you see this going. We do have, um, I'm looking at the attendees, we do have quite a few individuals in our attendees list that are, are actual entrepreneurs, innovators that are looking to help solve problems and are looking to meet a demand. Um, so I'd love to hear kind of what you think is, is, is next down the pike, if you will. So if I may start, I, uh, so <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, telehealth is special in the field of mental health because we don't necessarily have to physically examine our patients. As uh, is going to stay, there might be a battle between insurance services and the regulators to allow that because of two reasons. Number one is like the ease of it. And of course, when it's easier, it's more accessible and there will be more utilization. So I don't know the data on how much insurances have been paying more or less this year compared to the last year before in terms of telehealth uh, and telemedicine, but that could probably be the only limiting factor because otherwise, the, with the current state of technology that every kid has in their hands, a telepsychiatry and telemedicine is doable. Uh, I mean, what is interested in uh, uh, what is interesting to me is then the uh, next level of automation of some of these services. Let's say I do telemedicine. Let's say, and I'm talking. I'm going to talk about my passion of AR. Let's say I brought, bring a patient to my clinic to wear the AR headsets, and then we do exposure. And let's talk about a simple scenario of like dogs, and or like a more complicated scenario where I have created an, uh, like an ER with a patient very sick, uh, dying, and the frontline worker does the exposure or practice. Uh, and then when they go home, they will have their mobile app. And that part of it is like when, how these mobile devices will be advanced in terms of mixed reality and AR and face uh, sp spatial mapping. And then you will have, because a lot of these treatments we are offering are manualized, they are algorithms, which can be learned by AI. And basically an AI doctor, an avatar of myself with my similar to my face will be basically 
say, okay, now look at this little like a puppy Labrador and we'll next stage we'll do this and we'll do this. So basically patients can do home practices uh, via those kind of uh, uh, technologies. And I think when we move a lot of what we are doing to handheld devices or handheld devices, who knows, we will turn to glasses that people wear at home. Uh, this will explode uh, like any other area of our, uh, area of our life. You know, I'd like to build on what Dr. Ross mentioned. I think the AR VR component is, we see a tremendous opportunity. We're doing some things with that today um, with kind of diverging from pain as you're doing procedures with some of our, some of our patients but there's a much larger applicability to it uh, through all types of care. So um, we think that's gonna be really big for us in the future from a care delivery perspective. Also even from an education, education, educating our clinicians using that technology. So we're very interested in uh, moving some of those things forward. Um, I think obviously telemedicine uh, in, in all of our domains are going to continue to be uh, a key part of our, our model. We're, we're, so, we're really focused on the wellness and prevention side and so, um, you know, the, what the insurance uh, companies and providers, uh, you know, kind of where they go, um, that'll really be interesting. But we think the prevention piece is what's most important. And so we'll have a focus there. Uh, data, data, data is always key. But I'll say at the point of care and really becoming more automated with really strong algorithms to help make it easier for the clinician and provider. Um, you know, you talk about burnout. You're, you know, everyone always talks about the EHR, and it is a challenge, uh, so I don't want to discount that, but we have to make those things easier, and I think part of making it easier is with the uh, automation, with AI, with learning capabilities, making those things that they providers would normally have to find and search for, eliminating those things, so it's just there for them, or it's actually providing them that information, whether it's voice-assisted capabilities, those are the things that I think are, are, are really um, what the future holds for us. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we, we have a company that we've worked with here that I do believe, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe is in an incubator or an accelerator program, maybe through Children's Hospital of Orange County um, mm -hmm. that's working in augmented reality for pediatrics. So, <laughs> um, so there's definitely a connection there and, and, and pain management and things of that nature. But thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, and, and Lisa and Jeremy, what do you see coming down the pike? And, and um, you know, what kinds of things are you looking to expand upon or, or grow upon with your businesses? For us, it's, uh, we're really excited about the consumerization of, of healthcare. So Work It really was born out of this idea that like people were finding addiction care all wrong. And that like I had trailing Facebook messages from people who popped out of the ER and overdosed because our system for front dooring the experience is broken. Like, like um, John was saying, like, I think um, essentially having members have the power to drive their own care and understand the care that they're driving is the key to the future of healthcare. So in our case, that means we are developing chatbots and we are developing, um, we are using algorithms, but we use those largely in the service of care orchestration and care driving by patients to like help our patients find, we have over 773 CBT courses in our platform. Uh, in the past, we would have had a much more passive approach of each individual clinician will bestow each patient with a course that they picked just for them. Um, and we see the flip of that as being, you know, a machine can tell way better than any of our clinicians can tell when somebody's triggered because of travel and needs a travel course, or when someone's triggered because they just had a divorce and need a whole set of things around that, or their labs discovered they have hep C and now they need to understand that condition. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that we can build these tools so that it reduces the burden from the providers and lets the patients feel like they're in charge, I think the better, I think patients are gonna demand it, especially younger yeah. patients. Um, and we're excited to push the envelope there. Oh, thank you. That sounds great. Thank you. How about you, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, I think we Happy probably has a, a, a unique and, and maybe um, seemingly old-fashioned view of things. I mean, um, I don't think it's really in contrast to, to Dr. Arash or Elisa or John are saying, but I think our goal is to, um, to the extent possible, uh, to be frank, take technology out of healthcare um, in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of the people using Happy don't have an app. They don't have a smartphone. 
um, and their whole experience of, of the resources with a person, um, an actual human being. And I, I guess my, my own personal experience with healthcare is just increasingly spending less actual time, getting less actual undivided attention from healthcare professionals. And, and, to have, and, and most of it is just people getting my data and, um, and so, you know, we have very sophisticated communications platforms and, and ways to push and pull data with health plans. But from the, the people um, using our services perspective, our goal is to um, really bring a, a much more human touch to, to the experience. And I don't think that that's, um, uh, I, think the, I think these are all great ways to, to advance healthcare, but that's certainly um, where we plant our flag. Well, I'm thrilled that, that the conversations are happening. I cannot tell you in the last few weeks, several weeks, it, I've seen so many different platforms coming forward to have the conversation, different webinars and different roundtables and different, different conversations to try to remove some of the stigma, address the fact that we understand there's need out there and that all of you are looking at this from, from real progressive open eyes and, and looking for solutions. So um, I know I went a little bit over on my time, so I'm really sorry, Robert, but we have some questions in the Q&A and um, thank, you, thank you for this conversation. I could, I could go on all day and I won't, um, but we're gonna introduce Robert Plush who is, um, and I wanna make sure I even get your title right. So um, you're the head of partnerships for, for Scale Health and you're gonna jump on and you're gonna facilitate some Q&A from our audience. I see we have some questions there and um, I will leave that to you then and, and find my way off the screen. <laughs> Thank you, awesome. everybody. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks, Stacey. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to hear everything that's been said. Uh, certainly thank the panelists and, and for those that are attending. If you guys do have any other questions, we have a few questions right now. Please, please uh, certainly go to the Q&A and post them. Um, with that being said, though, I will, uh, I'll start with the first question. Um, the, to some extent, this was already answered by Dr. Arash and John, but I'd love to still hear your thoughts and then for, for the other panelists as well. Um, this question is around the solutions um, that have been discussed in this, you know, just, just in our conversation here. Um, a, a lot of it is, has been around the, the teleconnection with, with people. And so this person is wondering if there's been any studies around AI and, and avatar-based uh, interventions or support. I think there's quite a bit of, of research in this area. Like we look at this research all the time to see how far it's come along. Cause I was an early skeptic thinking that um, exposures as someone who is in recovery myself, that exposures in our space, in the behavioral health space, like walking up to a bar and turning down a drink would, would not be as effective as the smell, the look of uh, like the sensory experience of really turning down a drink in a setting with a bunch of friends having a great time. Um, and so I've always been skeptical, but I've been surprised as we've gone along. One of our advisors um, has been Dr. Uh, Itai Danovich at Cedar sinai who has done some compelling work um, with AI and um, in addiction. So we always monitor the space, but in my view, um, what's most promising is, is interventions that have been tested in other spaces that aren't necessarily healthcare. Like there's avatar apps like Replica um, that are not even necessarily designed as a healthcare app, um, but that are doing amazing, proving out amazing usage. Um, and that a ton of people will use a virtual avatar as their primary support. Um, and that really makes a lot of sense because um, a lot of this stuff is about privacy and confidentiality. Like these are stigmatized issues. So the idea that you would actually talk to your robot friend and tell them all these intimate things without fear that they're gonna share them in the community, it, it, it follows pretty rationally. And um, so I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes, uh, but excited to hear my co-panelist <laughs> dig into this one. <laughs> yeah, awesome, any other thoughts? <clears throat> Uh, you know, I'll, I'll add in just a, just a bit, you know, I, I think the, uh, it, there's not a tremendous amount of research on the pediatric side of this, but what we are seeing with the, just the things we're doing, uh, it is tremendous. You know, our, our, you know, kids are into this sort of technology um, in their personal lives. So it's a natural, for us, we see just as a natural way to enhance the care and to have them be more comfortable. So if you think about 
um, surgical procedures um, that, a, that, a, that a pediatric uh, patient may have, if you can walk them through what that's going to look like coming into the hospital, similar to what Dr. Ross was, was, was uh, showing us, you walk them through those things, it helps decrease their anxiety about what's getting ready to happen to them. Because it's already a stressful, stressful uh, situation anyway, uh, not only for them, but also for, the, for their parents. And so just the applicability of the impact, the positive impact on this, I think is just tremendous. I have that. I actually really liked <clears throat> uh, Lisa's approach of seeing, oh, or is there any other area where these avatars are working outside of healthcare? that can be expanded and I immediately thought, yes, gaming industry and see how many hours if doesn't have to be a kid, a 50 year old adult sits and interacts with those avatars and it's part of their real life. So it seems like they are yeah. applicable. And, and uh, like, uh, and one of our thinkings when we were thinking about like, creating an avatar of the real provider has been like, because there's a report between your provider as a real human, then you might be able to then create their avatar, kind of transfer that report and trust and continue. But uh, I think, yeah, that uh, this is an excellent question. And uh, a big chunk of our future might be like, uh, I just give patient an app and then the app is automated, like the AI is leading them through steps of, because anything that is that has an algorithm can be automatized. And a lot of our treatments, especially when it comes to the fields where we do exposure, they are very straightforward. Like in psychoanalysis, it will be much harder, but in these areas that we are working, it will be easier. So for, so, so again, just going back to the AI and, and these avatars, um, specifically around just healthcare workers and burnout, you know, a lot of adoption of things in hospitals certainly has to do with ease of use um, and the integration of that into just current workflow. And so how would you see, I mean, is there, you know, th this can't, I mean, we, we can't expect that, you know, a clinician um, or, or, or frankly, anyone that's working in a hospital is probably going to spend an hour with, with some avatar thing to decrease their anxiety. And so, you know, is there, you know, is there any thoughts around just having, just utilizing this type of technology where it's integrated into either current workflow or the access is easy, or it can be utilized in, in some type of short time frame where it really moves the needle um, and might help with anxiety and, and, and help with burnout uh, where it's not necessarily disruptive? Sure, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the physicians that, that, that I work with and the ones that are really interested in this, they see value in it. Um, they see value in not only um, for their patients, but also um, how it may help them get back time. I think Jeremy talked about it earlier. One of the main things, uh, a key part of my role is we don't want technology to be a barrier for the treatment and for the quality time that the patient, that the physicians want to spend with their patients. And so that's, that's something we, we have to constantly uh, focus on. So I think as long as it's going to do that, if it's going to give them time to focus on the care, then the providers are going to be very interested. But you, to your point, it has to be integrated really seamlessly into their normal workflow of, of care delivery. And that's always the, the most, uh, the, the challenging piece is figuring out how to make that simple and easy for them. But it's definitely doable. A lot, all I can add is that like we, we recently have uh, got some fundings from uh, Amtrak to package what we have been doing all this time to something which is usable by the clinicians. So we'll be spending a whole year to see, talk to all these different clinicians to see, because technology always brings the resistance. Like how will be is will it be the most easiest use? And I always, the example I use is uh, for my, uh, like, because I have like one of my programmers, he's super brilliant and super, like he's always in the clouds. I'm like, imagine your use end user is an older social worker sitting in their private office and see if they will be able and in like inclined to use it because we have a lot of these technologies like VR is already out there, but not many clinics are using them. So being like some me being able to show in my research lab that something works in a controlled research situation is one thing. Me being able to show that other people in a private clinic are not only able but also interested in using it is a different story. 
And awesome, awesome. I have like a, a cross-disciplinary team where you put the clinicians at ease and you're all working together. So we have like the engineering team daily working with our nurse practitioners and doctors because otherwise I think you get what I like to call like the Napster effect. You get this fear that like, the organization is productizing or completely replacing the clinicians when we're trying to help them and trying to make their lives better. It's like, are you automating my job? It's like, no, we're not. It's like, we're, we're, we're amplifying your job. Um, so I think you have to get past that nervous system fear that people have that times are changing and they're going to turn out to be the blockbuster in a world of Netflix and it doesn't have to be that way. No, great point. Great point. Uh, the next question is around, uh, the attrition of healthcare workers. And so obviously there's, there's a shortage of nurses. There's, that's been going on for a long time. Um, there's, there's a shortage of, of physicians and that's anticipated to grow. And so this question is around uh, the attrition of healthcare workers is due to COVID. Uh, and if so, what are your thoughts to rebuild the caregiving workforce uh, and what actions are being undertaken now to, uh, um, to try and hedge this? So I'm, I'll take a leap. I'll take my first stab. I'd be interested in what Dr. Raj has to say. I think it's more a structural national issue, to be quite honest. It's so expensive. And so it's a deterrent now. Um, and so I think, you know, that's one big element of, of, of this. I um, mean, even, even beyond just medicine, just attending college is extremely expensive you know, in this country. And I think if we don't really address that element of it, I think that that shortage may continue. Um, but I think one of the other things that uh, I think is important is how do you get to kids early enough to get them excited about being in this field? Um, I think that's one of the other elements that I think uh, we may be missing the mark on. Uh, and so, you know, you have a couple of those scenarios there. Um, if you can try to impact them in those ways, then I think you can kind of help uh, shift that trajectory. Um, but it's definitely a tough time these days. I mean, anything I say is just hypothetical because I'm not in the management roles who makes those decisions. But uh, I mean, they have been like, like, I mean, well, yeah, we clap for them and we just like say, oh, the frontline workers are awesome. And we talk about them in the like media and stuff. But at the end of the day, a loan forgiveness program for let's say who would go to nursing school might be more helpful like uh and 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 i agree i mean it's a philosophical discussion uh that uh, john briefly mentioned this is i believe in america the problem is that healthcare is a business rather than a service and that in a business the, your top priority is revenue it's not the service you're providing and that is one of the reasons that our healthcare is so much focused on treatment rather than prevention which could really, really lower costs. So we are not working on lowering costs. We are working on like creating revenue, which is a big problem and way, way, way or above my uh, paycheck. And uh, and like in fields like mental health care, it's, it's even worse because like we really, really have a shortage of psychiatrists. Right now, any of the academic centers like University of Michigan, Wayne State University, Henry Ford Hospital, you can find an, a faculty position as a psychiatrist which would be a dream job for a lot of people. Like we don't have people who can provide these cares. I mean, there have been a more rush of, uh, there's some hopeful signs in my field is that there was a time that psychiatry, because we didn't know much about how brain works, was like a kind of a, like the thing that physicians would only go if they couldn't become something else, a lot of people. But now with the, all the advancement and developments in the neuroscience and understanding neurobiology and good effective treatments, we are seeing more and more and more and better and better doctors are going to this field to become psychiatrists. So this is good, but the, but the, but the problem, especially the way uh, it goes with like a telehealth, the need will only increase. We will have more people now having access to the care that they didn't as easily before. That's very good sign on the other side, but on, the, on this side in terms of supply, I don't know. For us, we, uh, we have found that returning to the joy of medicine for our clinicians. Once we engage them in system design and actually building stuff, they get really, they geek out on helping to build the platform and they feel reconnected to what drove them into medicine in the first place. And so the more that we engage our healthcare workers with the design team, which 
took a long time, right? Like the engineers were like, I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> they have a completely different way of thinking. But now that it's working, I think it, it helps with retention because those, I can see difference between the clinicians that are engaged in that work and those that are just working with us on a moonlighting basis, part-time basis, just doing the clock in, clock out and the appointments. They're, they're suffering from that commodification feeling of healthcare. Like, have I become you know, Henry Ford's version of the, the, the auto worker on the assembly line now have like that feeling, I think really hit a lot of people during COVID. Um, and they just didn't wanna A, risk their lives and B, just like be a bot, be a human bot of, of medical delivery care. So I think we have work to do as a society, get back to the joy of this work and like the discovery pieces. Awesome, awesome. Just one more real quick question. So, I mean, obviously, you know, when you think of healthcare, um, obviously there's there's the clinical side of things. Um, with regards to like burnout, you know, there's a lot of operational uh, potential technologies that could be brought into healthcare um, that might ease the stresses um, around healthcare, uh, around with the clinicians. And so, are you guys seeing? Uh, yeah, like in, in, and I don't know if this is more of a question for John and Dr. Rosh, but um, but even for Lisa and Jeremy, like, are you guys seeing? You know that they're you know when you're looking at the overall um the overall aspect of healthcare and to your point dr ross is trying to do more preventative care you know there could be if there are more operational if 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 if, if hospital systems you know and, and again i know they are but you know if if they were to bring in more operational uh, uh solutions do you see that like easing some of the this burnout issue and 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 making things easier so the people who want to be clinicians, what what whether the nurses or doc can really focus on the clinical care and not have to worry so much about the you know the administ you know all, uh, excuse me all the administrative aspects you know of their of their jobs. You know, it's a good question, interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, the EHR, as I mentioned, you know, there's challenges with that, but even if it's the best and you've optimized it, um, there'll still be some challenges there. So I think there's a couple of things, um, um, education and just-in-time efficiency. Um, that's been one of the things that we've seen from some of the surveys that's, mo that's really important for physicians. Um, the ability to, to know how to use this technology as efficiently as possible so that they're not wasting time. Um, and so we see, we see value and they see value in that. We've seen some uh, where we've done that uh, and provided kind of just in time, watching them and work in the clinic and, and then giving them tips and say, hey, we saw you uh, went navigated this way to get to the chart review. If you go this way, you just eliminated four clicks. You're only gonna have two clicks as opposed to the seven or six that, you, that I just saw you do. Those things are impactful and important, but I'm gonna, say what what i'm seeing or what what i've seen across is the incentive so it's time so i think dr ross mentioned um it's a business so volumes matter in a lot of cases so if you if if, if that's the key driver um, then you're going to have less time less quality time because you're trying to see as many patients as you can that doesn't always equate to quality of the visit and so for us um, I think Lisa mentioned the joy of practice, our executive uh, physician over our primary care, he always uses that phrase. That's really important for him and his primary care physicians. And so trying to make sure that people, they have the time and that you're structured uh, so that you can create the time for, I have administrative work to do, but I have protected time to do that. And if that's not bleeding into my time for delivering care. Um, so I think those things have to be addressed. I think it's interesting that our thoughts both went to the same place <clears throat> when we were listening to your question. Uh, 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 well, I think if you ask any person in healthcare work, physician, nurse, what do you hate most about your job? Probably on the top three list is working with the EMR and EHR. You have to, because document, like I have to work with two or three different EMRs based on all these different clinics I have to work with, which means I have to learn all these. And then when you, well, just an example, if I have to do a renewal of a prescription of, let's say, an ADHD medication, which is a controlled drug, which I have to write every one month for a patient who's constantly take on this medication, I probably have to do eight or 10 clicks 
and enter and type in like three or four times to be able to renew one prescription of a one ADHD medication for one patient. Let alone when the documentation, you have to enter the billing code, you have to enter this, that, 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 and sign. And like that, sometimes signing doesn't go through. You have to do it again and call someone has to call sign. So if that can be automated, if someone, and, and I don't know why, because like, like Microsoft Word, which is the stupidest uh, software, while it's the simplest software among all these softwares, EMRs are the most stupid like systems to work with. If someone can automate these, like to the level that let's say they can even like, uh, I can like it uh, the speak and it will just turn it to the do documentation. And then I say, renew this prescription and that prescription and things are done. We will be a lot happier and I'm sure they will make tons of money. Great. So I'm on screen because I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm the buzz kill that <laughs> we got to wrap this up and, um, and I want to be thoughtful for our attendees time and for all of our panelists time. So I'm sorry to be the one to come in and say um, it's, it's getting to be that time. Um, I did put a little note in our chat. So if any of you have resources or um, anything that you can drop in the chat where people can get help, because at the end of the day, we really want to make sure that people have access to help. Also, we can, um, we'll drop that into any post event communication and make sure that people understand that help is available. There's places to, to get help if they need it. Um, and then, you know, Robert, and, and please jump in, but I, I can't thank you all enough for participating with us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you here. And I, I can think of 10 more conversations I want to have with each of you. So, sure. um, you know, Robert, why don't you jump in and, and say a few words as well? Yeah, yeah. With that being said, I mean, obviously, you know, for the panelists, um, they have their website. So for those that are in attendance, please, please uh, uh, check them out on, uh, you know, on their, uh, on their websites. Uh, uh, you can always look up scalehealth.com uh, and MedHealth, um, you know, for our resources. Um, there's a big push that we're working on in conjunction with, uh, with MedHealth around working with, with our partners to provide them uh, 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 great solutions. And so, you know, if anyone has any particular needs, you know, there's, we have a global presence and, and we've been able to, to have a lot of success with accessing uh, 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 really great solutions as well. And so, but with that being said, yeah, I mean, it, this was fantastic. Certainly appreciate uh, the panelists for your guys' times and I hope you, uh, you felt it was advantageous. And for those in attendance, uh, certainly thank you for, uh, 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 for joining us. And thank you, Stacey, we'll for, get a recording. For, oh, thank you, Robert. But we'll get a recording out to, to um, all of our attendees today. We'll also get those recordings um, somewhere down the line here up on our website. So um, Scale Health and Med Health websites. We'll make sure everybody has links to that. And um, we'll, we'll follow up with our audience, make sure they have any resources they need. And, and thank you again to our panelists. And I do want to do a little shout out to um, Rebecca Derdarian and Michelle D. Marchio, I'm, I know I'm pronouncing her last name wrong, but they have been the tech town um, techies, if you will, on the backside of all this. So there's Rebecca. So just want to say a big thank you to them for coming in and um, helping us on the backside. And thank you to all of you. The work that you're doing is tremendous. Um, and we're really, really pleased that you're out there working for the benefit of, of all of our frontline workers and, and beyond. So thank you.